Mistress Vania Changes Jobs Episode 3 Horace had suggested that Amanda could fit her entire life into the trunk of her car. He had meant it as a throwaway line, but Amanda had to admit the truth of it. Everything she either needed or valued was now in her car. There was a slight overflow of items into the back seat, but it was all there. "'What am I doing with my life?' she said to herself. "'At my age I thought I'd be more settled. I don't even have any pets.' The elderly man from downstairs was passing by. He had a diseased dog that looked even sicker than its owner. "'Packing up and leaving us?' asked the old man. Yes, said Amanda, distracted by the disgusting symptoms presenting on the dog. You know a place called Hapton Shufti? Never heard of it, said the old man. And at my age I've heard of most places. Must be an absolute backwater. The old man lost interest and started dragging his sick dog down the road. They got around thirty feet before the animal fell over onto its side, gasping for air. With considerable effort the old man picked up the dog and carried it back inside. This spectacle was not new to Amanda. The old man did this three or four times a day. It was, to her, an especially pointless ritual. Unlike the old man, the satnav on Amanda's phone had heard of Hapton Shufti. It was further away than she had expected, bigger than a village but smaller than a city. Two churches, one of which was converted into the clothing store for women, a selection of fast food outlets, and a supermarket. It all looked crushingly dull. The people who walked down the street looked either bored or dim. Nothing was happening. Pulling over to the side of the road, she parked her car and went in search of coffee. Her caffeine was low, and she needed a boost before calling Horace to tell him he was a complete scoundrel for sending her to such a dump. "'You scoundrel!' said Amanda on her mobile phone while sitting in a local café. "'You found the place all right, then?' said Horace. "'I knew you'd like it.' "'Don't try to sweet-talk me,' said Amanda fiercely. "'This is as drab and suburban as my worst nightmare. I've been to the local estate agent.' A lot of nice places to live if you earn twice as much as you're paying me. What on earth do these people do for a living? Deal drugs and run guns? Yes, conceded Horace. It's a bit of a dormitory suburb thing happening, what with the train station and the major rail line running straight through it. A lot of people commute. Tends to put up the prices. All those big salaries down south. I've been talking to my friend, our new employer, Janet Franklin. Wait a minute said Amanda, laughing. So this mysterious friend of yours has a name. They actually exist. I assumed you were making it all up and that you were behind it. I checked with Janet, continued Horace, unabated. And it seems she bought more than just the paper. She bought everything. That was the deal. All or nothing. So there's a house. The relatives have already emptied it, thankfully. Apparently it was following the same eccentric themes I noticed in the office. There's also a newspaper office in town. The house is about a mile out of town. The key should be at the office. The relatives sold the office complete with contents. Does that help your state of mind? OK, said Amanda, drinking the last of her coffee and checking her phone. Just because I'm not coming straight back to kill you doesn't mean you're off the hook. I'll go check out this office. If it's full of dead cheerleaders, then the deal's off. Although dead cheerleaders would be a good story way better than anything I'm expecting to find in this dump. The office was not full of dead cheerleaders, or serial killers. Potentially it had something worse. On every wall were hung large framed photos of the previous newspaper proprietor, each depicting him in various states of undress. Amanda might have called them boudoir or glamour photography, but this did not come close to describing the rippling, oiled spectacle of a middle-aged man in a g-string. It was vanity, on a level she had thought impossible, had she not seen it with her own eyes. He had attempted some kind of amateur bodybuilding photo montage. To Amanda, the photos on the wall looked a lot like cod liver oil tasted. Urgently, she took them down and placed them behind a sofa. 
Behind the desk she discovered a men's urinal, just as Horace had described it. She laughed nervously. "'Damn, Horace,' she said to herself. "'I thought you were joking. This is seriously messed up.' She pressed the old-fashioned mechanism, and it flushed noisily. Not happy with this either, she took a throw-rug from an armchair and draped it over the receptacle. It was a sight she could do without. A search of the office eventually yielded three different sets of keys. Amanda took them all. Potentially any one of them could have been the key to the house. Horace had given her the address, so she was able to drive there directly and inspect her new residence. She was pleasantly surprised. Clearly the previous owner had been prosperous. The house was a very discreet two-story building from the 1930s. Not surprisingly, the garden was overgrown on account of the previous owner being dead. She tried two or three keys in the door before finding the right one. The mail that was pushed through the slot in the door was mostly junk mail and catalogues. Angela noted that someone must have redirected the regular mail. Happily, the house was without strange vanity photos. They may have been there once, but someone had taken them, along with everything else in the house. It was very clean, although slightly musty. Looking out the window, the view of the garden was pleasant. There was even a duck pond. Upstairs there were four bedrooms, which were also empty. In one of these she set up her futon, with scrappy paint on the walls and no curtains. Her bed looked lonely in the middle of the room. It was like a before picture in a home makeover television program, which made her feel slightly depressed. With no table, she set up her laptop at the breakfast bar bench in the kitchen area. Happily, her wireless internet connection was good. She checked her email. There was already one from Horace, giving her her first assignment to get her started. It said, I found a nice dog show for you to cover, since you said you wanted one. I might be down myself later to see how you're managing. She laughed. Her quip about the dog show had been sarcastic, and Horace knew it. This was not her usual kind of story. She felt like she was starting out again, doing the low-end stories of a cadet journalist. At the rear of the house was a solid wooden door, bolted with a heavy steel brass lock. It was a trait of those in her profession that she must discover what was behind all locked doors. Her job, as she saw it, was to shine light into the dark places. She tried every key in her collection, of many keys. None of them fitted the padlock. Frustrated, she tugged violently on the lock, but with no result. Taking a big red cup from one of the two boxes she had unloaded from her car, she made herself another coffee. The only piece of furniture left in the house was a tall stool. She moved it to the breakfast bar bench and sat down to finish her drink. Dog shows, she said to the empty room in the empty house. How did it come to this? You have a lot to answer for, Horace. It had better be the best frigging dog show in history or I'm out of here. Amanda, unfortunately, was not optimistic. Mistress Vania could say with pride that she had never been to a gym, not as a participant, not even as an observer. Her body had reached its natural state of equilibrium, so in her opinion exercise for its own sake was truly pointless. Nevertheless, she was now at a gym and hopeful of finding some fat people. She also hoped to learn how fat people can be made thin. Of course, you could just starve them, but that sounded rather a dull way of going about it. Visiting a gym would provide her with some kind of benchmark. First she would investigate what she referred to as the orthodox method. Only then could she develop her own approach, adapting her years of knowledge to this new domain. The dominatrix approach to weight loss would change the world. The gym was clean, sharp, modern, and bang up to date. Like many of the more expensive fitness clubs in the central business district, it had a corporate feel. All of the members were office workers. They would never tire of saying, I just had my workout and I feel great. It always gives me energy to take on the day. These fatuous comments 
made no sense to Mistress Vania. She could not see how running yourself ragged in an exercise class for forty-five minutes could give anyone energy. Vince, one of the personal trainers, was roughly what Mistress Vania was expecting. A young, fit, chiselled body stuffed into lycra pants, a light blue tank top made of space-age breathable fabric, proudly displayed the gym's logo. Mistress Vania categorised him immediately as a rooster seeking compliments. Hi, Vania, said the personal trainer. I'm Vince. I think we spoke on the phone this morning. I never miss a new face around the gym. Yes, said Mistress Vania. I recognise your voice. Mistress Vania stared back at Vince as he tried to get a measure of the woman who stood before him. He struggled with her inscrutability. Most women were impressed by his physique. He knew this instinctively, and in practice he knew this from his dating success. He looked hot, and this gave him confidence, and women liked confidence, so that made them like him even more, which gave him still more confidence. He gave off vibes. The women gave off vibes. There was always, with Vince, a lot of vibes. It did not matter if they were twenty-five or fifty-five years of age. Women gave off vibes. But Mistress Vania, there were no vibes. In fact, none at all. Vince gave her one of his smiles. He shifted his weight, showed off his excellent calves. He was not holding back now. Turning to one side, he tensed the muscles in his right arm. They were lean and vascular. His arms were blasting. Women wept at the sight of his arms. Still there were no vibes. This woman was a frozen lake. Even if you broke through the layers of ice, all you got was the frozen water beneath. Mistress Vania was wearing dark grey business slacks and matching jacket, with a purple silk blouse and pearls. It was her way of being inconspicuous. At nearly six feet tall, Mistress Vania was intimidating in any form of dress. So, said Vince, becoming unnerved, I gather from what you said on the phone, you've never been a member of a fitness club before? I've never been in a gym before, said Mistress Vania, being more specific. Never, said Vince, taken aback. Like, not even a look? I mean, like not even a guided tour? My knowledge of gymnasiums is limited occasionally to seeing them depicted on television, said Mistress Vania. "'Okay,' said Vince, picking his next words carefully. "'So we've just suddenly decided to get fit?' "'I am neither fit nor unfit,' said Mistress Vania mysteriously. "'I'm not really sure what that means,' said Vince under his breath. "'But you're here, and that's a good start. "'So just step through here, and I'll show you round. "'The first room they entered was in the last stages of a spin class,' where a number of men and women were peddling on exercise bikes. Virtually all of them were straining, gasping, and sweating. Interesting, said Mrs. Vania, viewing them in a detached manner. They seemed to be in a genuine state of distress. The instructor was at the front of the class and also on a bike. She was yelling out seemingly random words of encouragement, most of which gave the impression the suffering would soon be over. "'Yeah,' agreed Vince, somewhat uncertain. "'I guess this is an advanced class. "'You may not want to start with something so intense. "'It's very much no pain, no gain with this class.' "'No pain, no gain,' said Mistress Vania, "'turning her attention back to Vince. "'As a child I was beaten by nuns. "'That certainly counted as a lot of pain, "'and I can say with certainty that I gained absolutely nothing from it, "'apart from a universal hatred of nuns.' Heavy, said Vince, picturing nuns running around with fighting staffs like ninjas. We have a boxing room for you if you um need to work out that aggression you have for nuns. Is that it? said Mistress Vania, over the sound of the upbeat music. Or is there more? Oh, yeah, said Vince, surprised. Heaps more. We have a sauna, a weight room, two more rooms for aerobic classes, a whole section for boxing-style exercises. Not to mention consulting rooms for ongoing fitness assessment and physiotherapy. Mistress Vania found most of the rooms quite boring. Coming to the fitness club was not as productive as she had hoped. Firstly, there seemed to be no fat people of any kind. She had assumed that fat people would come to the gym in order to become thin. 
The only heavy people there were in the weight-room. They were rippling with muscles rather than bulging with fat. One man, a stylized T-shirt stretched over his massive chest, was sitting upright in a machine. The action brought his arms together so that his forearms touched from elbow to wrist. "'What is that machine called?' asked Mr. Svania. "'That's the Pactec," said Vince, brightening at the prospect of a question he could actually answer. "'It's designed to work the pectoral muscles and your chest.' The man, who was still in the machine, operated it and growled like an animal, ignoring Mr. Svania as she approached the Pactec to examine it more closely. Annoyed, the man growled even louder with each rep, hoping to intimidate the mysterious woman in pearls. However, experts had tried to frighten Mistress Svania, and failed, so muscle men need not apply. "'There's no way of restraining them,' said Mistress Svania, walking round behind the machine. "'Sorry,' said Vince, slightly confused. "'How do you stop them from escaping?' said Mistress Svania. "'Clearly this poor man is not enjoying using this machine. What's to stop him from running away?' "'I guess the will to chase those gains keep them pumping,' said Vince, struggling for words. "'If any of our clients look like they're giving up—I mean, need some motivation—we might shout encouragement at them.' "'Shout,' said Mr. Svania. "'I tend to just whisper menacingly in their ear. Less is more with that sort of thing.' "'Really?' said Vince, taking note. "'Whispering. I must try that sometime. "'I work out because I like it.' said the muscle man in the exercise machine. "'I wasn't talking to you,' said Mr. Svania shortly. "'You're weird,' replied the man, flexing the muscles in his neck and shoulders to look fierce. "'Well, I'm not the one as brown as a berry and growling like an animal caught in a trap,' said Mr. Svania. The muscle man looked furious and went to reply, but could not think of anything to say while under the cool gaze of Mr. Svania. The final room was filled with exercise bikes, step machines and rowing machines this is our cardio room said vince so you work in the city yes said mr svania cautiously i can't remember what you said your line of business was said vince i didn't replied mr svania flatly oh yeah right said vince with a laugh hold on i'll guess i have a real thing for guessing people's professions i'm a regular sherlock holmes surprise me said Mr. Svania, suddenly looking even more bored. "'Lawyer,' said Vince triumphantly. "'No,' said Mr. Svania. "'Okay,' said Vince, not discouraged. "'But I'm close. You definitely work with people. I mean, you have a client business. In fact, I'd say you have a business of your own?' "'Yes.' "'Good,' said Vince, warming to the task. "'Um... This is harder than I thought. Usually my clients are lawyers, accountants, public relations, or personal assistants. You're none of these. Although, uh... All right, I give up. It's hard to explain, said Mr. Svania. I have to get into the mind of my client in order to give them what they want. Like a psychiatrist? asked Vince. No, said Mr. Svania. Not really. It's more a case of stripping back the dead wood bringing them back to the bare essence of themselves. Oh, I got it, said Vince, with a smile. You're a life coach. Yes, said Mistress Svania, with a smile. Being a dominatrix was a long way from being a life coach, but Mistress Svania decided it would have to do. Telling the truth would just get in the way and stop her from learning what she needed to know. That must be very satisfying work, said Vince. Yes agreed Mr. Svania. In fact, began Vince, we're in very much the same line of work. I improve the body and the fitness, while you improve the mind and the mental attitude. It's a real buzz to see people make progress with each session. So you really think it improves them, your clients? I'd like to think so, said Mr. Svania. At this point, the tour was over, and Mr. Svania was all ready to leave. She had seen all the people and the machines, there were no fat people, and she was now bored rigid. Yet Vince was still very enthusiastic about conducting a free fitness assessment. "'Is that how you decide if people are fat?' said Mr. Svania, the idea just occurring to her. "'Uh, sort of,' said Vince. 
I would normally tell my clients that their fitness and health levels were poor or needed serious attention straight away. But I've never actually called one of my clients fat. We, we like to stay away from the F word. To be honest, we don't really get many fat people here. It's kind of a lore of nature that the people who most need to go to the gym are the people who never come. Why? asked Mr. Svania. Good question, said Vince. I can't really answer that because I don't really know any fat people. In my line of work, I don't mix in those circles. This was a great disappointment to Mr. Svania. She had hoped to find fat people working out in the hope of no longer being fat. Still, this had been a valuable lesson. If you want to kidnap a fat person, don't go looking for one in a gym. Everyone at the gym is either very thin or very muscly. Do you have your gym gear to change into? asked Vince. I have told you, said Mistress Vania impatiently. I have never been to a gym, so why would I have clothes for such a place? Not a problem, said Vince, still patiently resilient to her cool gaze. We have a shop here that you can pick up everything you need. Ten minutes later, Mistress Vania was dressed in lycra and spandex from head to foot. She had black leggings and a fluorescent yellow top. I must say, said Mistress Vania, looking at herself in a full-length mirror, this is much more comfortable. More comfortable than what you are wearing, said the assistant in the store, considering the rather formal business attire that Mistress Vania had taken off. Her look of disdain was lost on Mistress Vania. No, said Mistress Vania, more comfortable than latex. As good as a rubber cat suit might look, it's almost impossible to get into and very sweaty when you finally get into it. By the end of a session I'm hot, especially if there's a lot of spanking and whipping involved. If it wasn't for Rico helping me, I'd never get out of it. She was uncharacteristically candid to the shop assistant. At the revelation of her new outfit, Mistress Vania had quite forgotten herself. Returning to Vince, Mistress Vania was taken through a number of strength and cardio tests. At the end of it, Vince went through her results. "'How can I put this?' said Vince. "'For your age, you are really quite fit, surprisingly so for someone that says they never do any exercise.' "'I guess my work keeps me busy,' said Mr. Svania. "'But I never exert myself without a purpose.' "'Your aerobic fitness is good,' said Vince. "'And your upper body strength was, I have to admit, surprising. "'Now you're in the lycra, I can see there's good muscle development in your shoulders and arms.' "'Thank you.' said Mistress Vania. When clients complimented her, she ignored them. It was merely an attempt by them to ingratiate themselves with her in the hope of lessening the metering out of punishment. To her, all compliments were little more than grovelling. However, on this occasion, she quite enjoyed being complimented on her appearance. She found that a change in context transformed everything. "'You don't play tennis?' asked Vince. Never, said Mr. Svania emphatically. Racquetball? No. Squash or badminton? No. Well, you've got me, said Vince, shaking his head. I'd bet the farm that you've spent years playing some kind of sport that requires a repeated swinging action. Everything in your muscle development says so. Mr. Svania smiled knowingly.